Okay, wonderful. Why don't we get started? Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Francesca Bregoli. I'm the director of the Center for Jewish Studies at the CUNY Graduate Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this evening's program, which features a presentation of Dr. Rebecca Jefferson's important new book, The Cairo Geniza and the Age of Discovery in Egypt, which was recently published by Bloomsbury. Our building on Fifth Avenue has now started reopening to the public, but we are still going to host talks on Zoom this semester. As we've certainly become very aware in the past two years, this medium has proved very effective at reaching audiences far away. And uh, it's wonderful to see some old friends on this call, but also many new faces. If you'd like to learn more about the Center for Jewish Studies at the Graduate Center, please email us so that we can keep you appraised. And I'm going to make sure to put all contact information in the chat box in just a moment. I also want to mention that Bloomsbury is pleased to offer 20% off the Cairo Organiza in the Age of Discovery in Egypt with uh, two codes that are too complicated to say out loud, but I'm going to put that information also in the chat box momentarily. Um, this event is going to be recorded and later it will be up the, uploaded to the center's YouTube uh, channel. Uh, so I want to invite you to please keep your microphones muted during Dr. Jefferson's talk. And after her talk, we will have plenty of time for questions. If you have a question, please feel free to either type out your question if you're not able to unmute yourself, uh, or you can type the word question in the chat box and I'll make sure to unmute you in the order that we receive. Um, without further ado, let me introduce our evening's speaker. Rebecca Jefferson is the curator of the Isser and Ray Price Library of Judaica at the University of Florida and a joint faculty member of the Center for Jewish Studies there. Her PhD in medieval Hebrew is from the University of Cambridge, where she also worked on the Geniza Research Unit's bibliography project. Jefferson's ongoing personal research involves an in-depth investigation into the discovery of the worldwide Cairo Geniza collections. Her book on the subject, The Cairo Geniza and the Age of Discovery in Egypt, was published by Bloomsbury this year, just in February. Uh, so Dr. Jefferson, the floor is yours. We're really excited and welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for that kind invitation, that kind introduction and the very kind invitation to um, speak tonight and to the Graduate Center as well for inviting me. Um, I'm just gonna uh, set my timer because I don't wanna go over. <laughs> um, I wanna keep to time, so I'm doing that. Um, and then I'm just going, what I'm gonna talk about tonight is because I realize that maybe there's some people in the audience who are not familiar with the Cairo Geniza story. So I'm gonna start off with a few slides to tell that story very basically. Um, and, and, and in the traditional manner that uh, we've, we've, we've heard the Cairo Geniza story before. And then what I thought I would do, because my book is somewhat complicated in that it, it follows a lot of characters, a lot of protagonists, and it's really difficult to explain in a nutshell, what I thought maybe I could do was um, share my discovery of the discovery, the way I came to the book and why I constructed it as I did, and some of the main, some stories of the main protagonists that are in it. So I, I shall move on now. <laughs> um, so the, the image that you're seeing there on the screen uh, is a Yemenite prayer book that I actually purchased from eBay uh, for my library as a sort of a teaching tool. And I was just fascinated by the fact that hidden within uh, its binding were these um, lead fragments of manuscript that the Yemenites used uh, um, to fortify the binding. And that was a type of Geniza that the Yemenites used as part of their culture. And so I, I think it's really nice that I'm able to use this on the front cover of my book um, to indicate that there are many types of Genizot <laughs> and not just one uh, Geniza in the world. Okay. So to tell the basic story, uh, we'll start with what is a Geniza. Um, uh, it comes from the root letters Gimel Nun Zion, uh, and it means hiding or storing. It comes from a Persian word first found in the biblical book of Esther, uh, referring to a, a, a treasury uh, room. Over time, it becomes used as a noun to refer to a place of storage. So the, the noun Geniza is somewhere where you would hide away sacred books that have either become worn or disused or are defunct in some manner. They, they contain errors uh, in the text. And you place them in this uh, storage place 
usually within or without a synagogue. Um, and there they stay for a period of time when usually, but not always, um, they're taken out and buried. And, and very often, but again, not always, <laughs> alongside um, the body of, of a scholar. They're given that sort of uh, same sacred texts that are stored away and hidden away, given that same sort of sacred reverence um, that the human body is um, um, when buried. So here is a map of, um, of, of old Cairo, uh, and this is where our famous Geniza was discovered. Um, and you can see that uh, largely it shows the area known as the Fortress of Babylon, or Casa el Sham, as it was called um, after the um, uh, Islamic um, conquest. Um, and it was largely um, from the Byzantine period um, um, a, a Christian and Jewish enclave, mostly Christian, many churches there. Um, but uh, in the Middle Ages, there were three synagogues, one belonging to the Babylonian Jews, one belonging to the Jews of the land of Israel, the Palestinian Jews, and a Karite synagogue too. Um, the synagogue that concerns this story is the synagogue, um, the Ben Ezra synagogue, which was also known as the synagogue of Elijah and by many other names as well. Um, as far as we know, the synagogue was there possibly uh, ninth century, uh, got destroyed by the Fatimid Caliph uh, in the 11th century and then rebuilt. Um, and then over time suffers various forms of damage due to fire. There's a fire in the 12th century, another fire in the 15th century, many ongoing restorations to the building, but largely the same building stands there uh, for hundreds of years and really go, um, not much alters. And so the Geniza that's stored there, um, or Genizot that are stored there, um, are largely there over a, lo uh, a long period of time, many centuries. So there it is, there's the Ben Ezra synagogue, and you're seeing an image on the left of, of, of its actual restoration um, in the 20th century, uh, and on the right, what it looked like after the restoration. So it has gone many sort of alterations over time, basically maintain that sort of uh, main shape uh, as far as we know. Um, the, um, the, the Geniza, by the way, that was discovered was discovered on the second floor of the building um, uh, 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 in a room um, uh, hidden away on the women's gallery on the second floor. So the way the story is traditionally told is that it starts with uh, two uh, women scholars. Their name were, names were Agnes Smith Lewis and Margaret Dun Dunlop Gibson, and they were twins. Uh, they grew up um, uh, by the, tutored largely by their father, taken to many countries, learnt many languages. Uh, the image that you see on the right is uh, Agnes Lewis being winched up on a chain into a monastery so that she can go and examine the monastery's manuscripts. Uh, they were great manuscript hunters in their own right and were known for their discovery of a very important uh, Syriac version of the Gospels uh, in St. Catherine's Monastery uh, on Mount Sinai. In the spring of 1896, uh, they got word that there were some um, important manuscripts for sale in Cairo, uh, and they went hot foot to Cairo <laughs> to check it out, um, and they came away with several sacks of manuscripts. They took the manuscripts back home to Cambridge with them, started sorting through them, and then came across a couple of manuscripts that they couldn't recognize. They, they were tutored in classical Hebrew, but not post-biblical Hebrew. And the manuscript that you see there on the left is in post-biblical Hebrew. And so they called their, their close uh, Cambridge friend, Solomon Schechter, who is the reader in rabbinics at Cambridge, to come and examine this piece. He had a look at it and was immediately excited about it. For him, it represented something that was a culmination of many years of scholarship, um, he'd been studying um, the, uh, the sources of Ben Sira, uh, the book of Ecclesiasticus um, in rabbinic texts, and he'd, he'd um, uh, speculated that for many years um, there was a Hebrew original of this text. The, the Hebrew original had got lost, it'd been translated into Greek, um, but Shechter was using the rabbinic sources to prove his theory about the, the Hebrew original. Now placed in his hand was this medieval copy of the original Hebrew. Uh, and he knew the text so well, so inside out, that he knew that this was the case. He did go to the library to double check his sources. And then in the middle of the night, he wrote to the two ladies uh, of this excited discovery. And that's his letter that you can see uh, on the right there. And he swears them to secrecy about it. 
Of course, he goes and gossips to everyone around about it immediately. Um, but uh, not long after, they publish this immense news. This this uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, manuscript had been found, and what it suggested to Schechter was, well, if this could be found in Cairo, and I and he already knew about other pieces surfacing from Cairo, then there's some great source to be had there, and I want to get to it. Um, also because he really wanted to retrieve the rest of this text if it was at all possible. So in a nutshell, <laughs> Schechter um, uh, gets the support of several scholars in, in, in Cambridge, um, most importantly the support of Charles Taylor, the um, master of St John's College, uh, who offers him financial support to travel to Cairo and locate the source of these wonderful manuscripts. Uh, uh, Schechter goes there, um, he uh, courts the chief rabbi, he's got a letter from the chief rabbi of England, he courts the chief rabbi of Cairo by smoking cigarettes with him and drinking copious cups of coffee, uh, and uh, these are, uh, the, the chief rabbi opens the door to him uh, and takes him to the Ben Ezra synagogue up to the second floor, opens up the women's uh, gallery and this this, this hidden chamber in the women's gallery where Schechter discovers all these amazing hidden manuscripts. And he's allowed to take as much as he likes and he spends many weeks shoving it all into sacks. And here you can see the photo of him back in Cambridge with his many, many sacks of fragments. What did he have in these, in these sacks of fragments? Well, the find was uh, immense and very, very important. Um, and today we know that there are around 300,000 plus fragments, not all were with Schechter. Um, we speculate that now in what we have now in Cambridge is about 193,000 fragments. Um, they range from monumental texts such as works by Maimonides, and here you can see a draft of his Guide of the Perplex that was handwritten by him, and that's in the Geniza, and it goes from the sublime to the ridiculous, uh, right to sort of uh, everyday scribbles and jottings, um, but, but everything that was written down by the Jewish community of Cairo and those across the world with whom they interacted, that's what's in this Geniza, and it range, it's Hebrew, Judeo-Arabic, Arabic, many other languages, largely from the 10th to the 13th centuries, but also pieces from before and after that period too. And pieces, as I said, from across the Mediterranean, all of their contacts, uh, including contacts made as part of the India trade. So it, it's a, a really important collection that has revolutionized the study uh, of the Jewish communities in the med medieval uh, Mediterranean. So um, by the time we, we sort of reached today. That's the story that's often told. That's um, it's it's a uh, it's. It's, it's, it's the core of the story, but it's not the whole story. Um, but at any rate, when, when, when scholars and, uh, have imagined what the Geniza, uh, Cairo Geniza looks like and is today, um, they tend to think of about 20 main major collections that have uh, um, been established around the world. So there was the Schachta was the main collection in Cambridge University Library. He took it back to Cambridge uh, and, and donated it to the library. And then, um, before and after him, uh, various collections emerged, and these are those around the world. Um, in addition to the Ben Ezra Synagogue, some of the collections emerged from the Bassatine Cemetery, uh, particularly that of Jacques Mosseri's, his own private collection, which is now in Cambridge, and some collections that came out of the Karait Synagogue in Cairo. But that uh, uh, image is really how we picture the Cairo Geniza, this sort of worldwide global um, set of sub-collections of a sort of globalized Cairo Geniza. And um, when, when people talk about the whole history of it, they tend to talk about around 12 main figures associated with um, acquiring these collections. And, and here you can uh, see them there. Um, so that's, that's essentially the traditional Cairo Geniza story. So um, my book starts uh, way back when I was working in Cambridge as a bibliographer um, um, with all of these fragments. Uh, and it really starts because um, I started to question how these worldwide collections came about. I already knew the story of the Cambridge collection, but how did the other ones come about? And it started because we did a, um, a large digitization project um, on the Cambridge Geniza collections. And that was um, brought about by um, a philanthropist in, um, in Canada, um, Dov Friedberg, 
who uh, was very generous and uh, put up the funds to do a sort of global digitization project. His vision was that every single fragment around the world would be digitized. And then what scholars would be able to do would be able to match them back up again. And here you can see some of the results of that work. And this is, um, again, draft uh, of, of Moses Maimonides, beautifully matched, uh, thanks to digitization, two collections, one in, um, uh, in Cambridge and one in Manchester. So that was the vision. So the, the idea was you have this chirogenism that's been spread around collections around the world. And once we digitize them, we can match them all back up again. <laughs> um, but um, when I started to question um, some of how the, some of these uh, collections came about and do a little bit of digging, um, some very interesting stories emerged that showed that what we thought the story was wasn't quite the story. Um, and so some of the one of the first characters I came across was this um, Count Riamo Dulst. Um, and I came across him because I, I started to do some search, searches in the Jewish Chronicle of London to see what was being published at the time, what people were talking about the Geniza at the time. And I hit upon this article called A Geniza Secret. And it was um, essentially talking about how the Bodleian librarian um, was apologizing for having forgotten to mention the contribution of this man um, to the Bodleian Geniza. Um, and, and so I was most um, intrigued by this. Um, I, I did some uh, digging to find out who he was, and I found out that he was a member of the Egypt Exploration Fund. Um, so I went to the Egypt Exploration Fund archives and did some looking there and found um, many things, including this letter that you're seeing on the left, in which he talks about how he's been doing some digging in uh, Old Cairo in 1889. Um, and uh, he's happened to found, found some um, Hebrew manuscripts. He's digging around that area I showed you on the map. Um, around the Ben Ezra synagogue, around that fortress of Babylon. And that's where he's come across these Hebrew manuscripts. He's sending them onto the Egypt Exploration Fund and asking them for instructions of what to do with them. Well, the Egypt Exploration Fund then sends them to the British Museum. The British Museum rejects them, not interested in them. And eventually they make their way to Oxford and the connection to who found them gets lost. Um, but with much digging, I was able to sort of um, uh, bring that connection back again. And here is a character who actually is involved with the Geniza discovery um, over many decades, starting in um, 1889 and going right through, well, even into the 20th century. Um, and, and so my first article was all about him. Uh, well, mostly about him. I called it a Geniza secret. Um, and what I managed to uncover through him was this whole race between um, Cambridge and Oxford to be the first to sort of uh, discover and uncover uh, the Geniza manuscripts um, in Chi Old Cairo. Well, that led me then to um, uh, my next article, which was Cairo Geniza Unearthed, because after I discovered that the Count Dulst was uh, engaged in excavations for Oxford in 1898, um, I then uh, and then I looked at all the the, the Oxford catalogues to try and trace which manuscripts he'd sent to them, and I couldn't find them. And I was asking myself, well, where did all these boxes of things that he says in his letters he's uncovered many many boxes uh, of fragments for Oxford and sent them on to them in 1898? Well, where did they all go? So my next investigation was was that, um, and here you can see um, an image of Adolf Neubauer, who was the sub librarian then and collecting for Oxford, and um, Aiken, Elkin Nathan Adler, who was a lawyer and bibliophile, who was also on the prowl and looking for Geniza fragments and, and amassed a massive private collection that eventually wound up in the Jewish Theological Semin Se uh, Seminary. And what I uncovered was by going through to the institutional records in the Bodley in Oxford that I found um, what was called a sale of waste. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this ledger, this book, um, uh, 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 proved that it, Elkin Nathan Adler was the person who purchased all the boxes that the Count had sent to Oxford and that Oxford actually decided to reject because they were just rubbish. <laughs> so they put them in the sale of waste. So that was... Um, uh, very revealing to me. And now I was seeing that there were a lot of a sort of circulation of fragments um, and a lot of untold stories about these various collections. So my next uh, step was to um, 
look at a character who came up in the course of examining all these excavations that are happening in 1898. Now, these excavations are taking place after Schacht has been and has taken away that, that image of him in the room with all those manuscripts. He's taken those away. And as far as um, anyone is concerned, he's taken away everything. But that's not the truth because there were many things remaining in Cairo and many things buried in Cairo. Uh, and um, uh, the Count is, uh, has been hired secretly by Oxford to find those and excavate those. Um, and somebody who observes him on the ground is this little known character called Reginald Q. Enrique. Um, and Enrique uh, encounters uh, uh, Dulst one day uh, excavating and challenges him and asks him what he's doing there. Now, Enrique, no one knew this, um, but he was a Cairo based um, Jewish Manchester businessman and he, uh, a, a Shech, he befriends Shechter um, while Shechter is in Cairo and um, it does him a lot of favors because Enrique is very well connected to the leading Jewish families of Cairo. Uh, and, and actually becomes a linchpin for Schechter's success in Cairo. And the reason for that is because uh, uh, Enrique was a very good friend of the character you see above him, um, Harry Boyle, who was Lord Cromer's right-hand man. He was the Oriental Secretary. Um, it's very interesting to me that they both have the same mustaches, <laughs> look very much alike, they were great friends. Um, and it's thanks to this friendship with Harry Boyle that Schecht is able to get the, um, the permit to be able to ship all those massive fragments out of Cairo. Because you can imagine when he got to customs, there would have been one or two questions about these many, many boxes of manuscripts leaving Egypt. And um, so Enrique uh, and Boyle are sort of key, key to his success. Um, and Enrique is also very interesting because he continues after Sheikh Dalis Kairi continues to be something of an agent for him on the ground, kind of spying on what's going on, because they're all in the know that there are fragments remaining. And Sheikh wants them as much as anybody else. Uh, and so Enrique is sending him letters, and these letters are preserved in, um, uh, in Cambridge University archives. All these things are kind of hidden in plain sight. It's just we really need to just go digging for them. Um, and so all of these letters reveal that Enrique is sort of nabbing these fragments from uh, as, as the count is digging them up, Enrique is confiscating them <laughs> and um, uh, keeping them for Schechter. And eventually he ships these to Schechter. And sadly, uh, everything he shipped to Schechter sort of gets uh, subsumed into that whole um, Geniza collection in Cambridge University Library, and the connection to Enrique gets forgotten about as well. Um, so that was uh, that. Then, because I was um, asking questions, then because I saw that there were many, many fragments um, coming out after Schechter, I started to ask myself questions about the fragments before Schechter. And I knew that there were, obviously there are collections around the world, so we know that things came out at various points. Um, and it was known. I mean, I, this, um, I did a lot of digging and I've, I've, I've had this sort of journey of discovery myself, but I'm not the only person to do it. And there have been many scholars before me who have um, investigated aspects of the Cairo Geniza discovery story. So it was known that there were people before Schechter who got to fragments. And it was even known that one of the one person that you see here, uh, Greville John Chester, um, a vicar from Sheffield in the UK and, and, a, and a, um, a collector, antiquities collector, was one of those persons who supplied Oxford in the very early period. And he supplied Oxford from 1890 to 1892. Um, but um, and, and, and just to show you how some of this comes about, uh, some of the things I showed you before was, were due to my own digging. But at the time uh, I was digging, there were some other people doing some digging too. And that was the fabulous um, Adina Hoffman and Peter Cole. And I had a great time with them. Uh, they shared so kindly shared with me their journey of discovery too. And we were sharing bits of information with one another. And one of the things they shared with me was, um, uh, their discovery of this archive of Greville Chester's in Oxford, which really completely reveals um, how fragments were coming out of Cairo in the early period before Schechter, between 1890 and 1892. And it has all of his correspondence um, with the Bodleian as he's mailing to them packages of fragments that he's found 
well, he hasn't found them actually, he's working through a dealer in Cairo. And what's really great about the Chester collection is that you can see the postcard at the top there on the left. That's his very first discovery um, in 1889. Um, so while the Count is finding some fragments outside uh, the, in, outside the fortress of Babylon, he is finding fragments right in, uh, the, in the Ben Ezra synagogue. Um, so he's the, one of the very first people to step foot into the Geniza in the Ben Ezra synagogue, and the fragments that he sends are actually truly the only fragments that we can really say came from the Ben Ezra synagogue um, Geniza chamber, the medieval Ben Ezra synagogue cha Geniza chamber. And then the, the postcard at the bottom there on the left, that's the very last postcard he sent, and that's when he discovers that the what's happened is the, the Ben Ezra synagogue has undergone one of these restorations, but in fact, it was a very dramatic restoration, because unlike other restorations where, where there's just been some little alterations, this, the community brought the, um, the synagogue down to its foundations and rebuilt it again. And so the medieval building has gone. And um, what Schechter actually encountered was a whole new building that had only recently been uh, constructed from 1892. So what he found in, his, in the Geniza chamber was not a genuine old Geniza as he thought, or at least as he, he tried to tell everyone, um, it was a Geniza that had been placed there since 1892. Now there's plenty of evidence to suggest that the Geniza he found there was, part, most of it was originally there or in some place in or around the synagogue. Um, but it had been placed back there. So between 1889 and 1892, something happened to all the fragments that were discovered in the, in, in the Ben Ezra synagogue. And so those are the questions I started to ask myself next uh, in, in an in a article I did for the Jewish Quarterly Review called Deconstructing the Cairo Geniza, really wanting to know what happened to those manuscripts during that key period. Um, because we really don't know anymore what was in the medieval Geniza chamber. Um, it's, 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 it's lost information. So there, were, there, are, there are many possibilities. The, the manuscripts could have been buried in the Bassatine Cemetery. And in fact, many uh, collections were discovered there at a later period. Um, or they could have been hidden in an underground chamber um, in the synagogue. Because when the community um, brought the, the, the synagogue down to its foundations in 1889, when they rebuilt it up again, they, um, they changed it. They placed underneath, um, they, they raised the foundations from the ground level. And so now there was a, there was a chamber underneath uh, the synagogue. So it may have been that the, the manuscripts were all um, placed in there and then eventually replaced into a Geniza chamber on the second floor uh, near the women's gallery. And, and the image that you see there on the left, that's um, a drawing that was done in, um, in the 20th century by uh, Jacques Mosseri, who was uh, an Egyptian Jewish man who was a collector himself. Uh, and he went and asked people for their memories of what the old medieval synagogue looked like. And he tried to draw it out. And we can use his drawing today and compare it with, um, with the actual synagogue and um, architectural plans of the actual synagogue today and see what the changes were. And indeed, as I said, one of these uh, the, the foundations were raised up. And so there was room underneath for storing Geniza, chamber, uh, Geniza manuscripts too. And the reason that I say all of this is because um, it goes back to the Count Dulst um, and what he was discovering for Oxford, uh, unbeknown to many, many people. Because in 1894, he was on the hunt for all the manuscripts that Greville Chester had been supplying to the Bodleian uh, between 1890 and 1892 and it took him some time to discover it but when he did um, he wrote uh, a letter and that letter then got sent to Oxford saying that the, manus the manuscript the place from which all these manuscripts had come was an underground was a subterranean chamber and so we don't know any more than that other than it was underground but we don't know exactly where and then there's a letter sent in 1895 to say at last all the manuscripts are coming in which suggests that there's been some the, the manuscripts have been moved from an underground place uh, back inside somewhere um, so it's, it's 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 a very complex story um, and this is all the things that i've been unraveling over time through various um, investigations and articles 
Um, and one of the uh, things uh, that also came up during the course of starting to write the book was uh, uh, some of the people who had gone to the Ben Ezra synagogue even prior to this time in the 1880s. Um, and one of those, and I, and I um, was very lucky to have um, a scholar who's working on uh, Moses Shapira and his um, notorious um, Deuteronomy sc scroll, his uh, supposed forged Deuteronomy scroll, and that's Idan Dershowitz. And Idan uh, kindly shared with me um, the existence of Moses Shapira's handwritten catalog, which is now stored in the um, uh, National uh, Library in Berlin. And it gave great, great insights into um, what um, early uh, collectors, manuscripts, hunters were uh, discovering in the Ben Ezra synagogue in the 1880s, way before uh, the synagogue is restored in 1889. And here you see his list. Uh, he's listing various scrolls and fragments of scroll, scrolls that he's finding from Geniza of Cairo. But this is not our Geniza, because right at the very end, the very last item on the list says that he's got some fragments from the so-called scroll of Ezra in the synagogue at Old Cairo. So he's clearly differentiating between this Geniza of Cairo and the old synagogue in old, uh, the synagogue in old Cairo. And it, it does appear from the materials that he collected and afterwards gave uh, sold to the British Library um, that they were his fragments were mainly from the Karite synagogue. Um, and so it seems that manuscript hunters in the period before um, anyone was aware of there being any sort of Geniza in the Ben Ezra synagogue was um, their main interest was the, this so-called scroll of Ezra, this famous scroll of Ezra that was housed in the synagogue and everything else was hidden. Um, part of my journey as well was discovering and thinking about um, the dealers involved in getting these fragments out of Egypt um, and around the world. And, and I was very much helped by this wonderful book by Frederick Hagen and Kim Ryholt. And it's one of the first investigations into the um, antiquities trade in Egypt from the perspective of the dealers. Uh, and they, they provide this wonderful list of all the dealers in Egypt known in this period. And this was very helpful for me because the character on the left, you can see um, um, uh, is, is the uh, dealer, uh, 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 I'll get it out in a minute, Ali El Arabi, and he was a dealer in Giza, and he's known, he's connected to Geniza fragments in the 20th century. He was a seller to Charles Langfrey, uh, of the uh, whose Geniza collection is now in the Smithsonian, and he was a seller to uh, Francis uh, Kelsey, whose uh, small uh, collection of Geniza fragments is now at Michigan. And so, um, it was really uh, eye-opening for me to be able to start thinking about the dealers because uh, Schechter had famously said that the discovery of the Cairo Geniza was thanks to the unsung dealers of Cairo. And so to be able to get some of those names now was amazing. And this really was something that uh, got the book rolling. Um, um, and then looking at some of what I did uh, for the book in preparation for the book and trying to tell this whole history of manuscript hunting that begins uh, way back sort of in the mid 19th century through to Schechter's period and beyond, started to think about what manuscript hunters were looking for and where they were looking. And some of the main sites that they were looking at such as um, <clears throat> tombs in the Valley of Yehoshaphat uh, in, 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 in Jerusalem uh, and in the cave of uh, uh, Machpelah in Hebron. And these are sites that all of these manuscripts hunters go to, including Schechter. Uh, and there are various reports. And again, I had scholars connecting to me and sharing um, information about um, um, manuscripts hunters who were uncovering fragments of scrolls in some of these places. It also shows how, when we look at the Cairo Geniza today and the mix of material that's in there, I told you that there's, um, there's the, the large portion of it is 10th to 13th century, the medieval classical Geniza portion, but there are also portions from other periods and the later, and some of the later material doesn't seem to fit with the idea of a Geniza uh, in, a, in an old synagogue in Cairo from the medieval period. And so it's possible that some of the pieces that were, that ended up in this massive cache um, uh, came from some of these other Genizot. 
so uh, as I was writing the book, I was also thinking about the historiography of the Cairo Geniza uh, discovery, what historians were saying and um, how this whole narrative of uh, this discovery came about. Um, and here you can see one of the first, well, there were three main narratives that um, emerged right away, right after Schachter's discovery. Um, they were put forward by the scholar David Kaufman in Budapest, by um, Elkin Adler, the bibliophile, um, and by Solomon Schachter himself. And Elkin Adler um, had acquired his own collection um, from the Ben Ezra synagogue um, just prior to Solomon Schachter. And he writes this um, discovery story in the Jewish Quarterly Review in 1897. And essentially you can see here, um, he's got various collections in, in dark blue, um, the various collectors in light blue, and some of the dealers that he mentions. But this is essentially the story that underpins all the, the narrative that will follow for over a hundred years. <laughs> Um, with Solomon Schechter exhaustively ransacking the Geniza and these few collectors and collections. But um, what I've, my book shows is this is actually what the situation was like in 1897. <laughs> um, <laughs> there were many collectors on the ground. Uh, there were many dealers on the ground. Uh, and there were also many locations from which these manuscripts are emerging. Um, and as I said, it's really rather hard to, um, to, to encapsulate, and there's why I tried to do this visual of it. Um, and again, another visual to show you uh, the number of collectors and dealers uh, 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 involved in this story. And this is not all of them because I couldn't, I couldn't fit it all on one slide um, and I couldn't even find all of the images of all of the collectors and all of the dealers involved. Um, some of the stories that I, uh, I talk about in the book, uh, one of these is a, a kind of little known protagonist. His name is Mordechai Adelman. Um, it, it's not that he wasn't known. He was known. A, a, a scholar discovered his connection to David Kaufman in Budapest. Uh, David Kaufman uh, amassed a, 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 a sizable Geniza collection, an important Geniza collection, but no one's really ever known how he got it. We don't really still know how he got it. Um, but one scholar has dis discovered the connection to Mordechai Adelman, and you can even see it recorded in, in, in Kaufman's own manuscripts, that in the purple ink there in the image on the right, that's one of Kaufman's manuscripts, and in, in Hebrew script he writes, I got this from my friend Mordechai Adelman in Jerusalem. Now, Mordechai Adelman uh, was born in Europe. He studied in Vienna. He was a good friend of Solomon Schechter's and a good friend of David Kaufman's. And he was someone who was, oh, I've uh, got to my timer. Oh, dear. OK, uh, I'm going to have to go quickly now. <laughs> um, and he was um, uh, very interested in uh, uh, discovering uh, manuscripts himself. Um, and uh, he was even uh, appointed by the Vatican to uh, go and find important manuscripts. Uh, he had a little bit of an, uh, 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 he was robbed during one of his journeys in Persia. And so he ends up in Palestine. He's uh, connect to, connected to the building of the National Library. Um, and we know from Kaufman's catalog that he sent him many um, fragments, uh, many manuscripts from a Geniza in Jerusalem. So he starts to, ex he's a character who expands this story of Gnizot and what's coming out of Jerusalem and uh, Palestine. So very quickly, I'll try and run through the rest. Um, another known dealer that I, de uh, that I talk about is Rafalovich, Samuel Raffaele Rafalovich. He is known, uh, he's been talked about before, but perhaps what's not so well known about him is, is his, his expertise in, um, in, in coins, um, and he was um, sort of a builder of museums in, in Palestine, uh, and, and, so, and all of his sort of uh, exploits in the antiquities trade, I've tried to kind of show that and show how, um, how deeply connected he is to the Geniza trade in the late uh, 18, uh, 19th century. Uh, this is another diagram to show you um, really how, uh, what happened after Solomon Schechter published his great account of discovering the Cairo Geniza is that somebody wrote um, um, an anonymous letter to the Times to say, hey, that's not the story. He's failed to recognize oh. certain people. And that, um, and really that somebody uh, gave him 
uh, Elkan Adler gave him the keys to Cairo. Uh, and Schechter sort of um, denies this in a, in a counter letter. Um, but what I try to show in the book is that, yes, really, he did have many keys to Cairo. And he had a fabulous network of people that enabled him to be able to take these manuscripts home and to discover other manuscripts around Cairo and in Palestine. And so the story is much more complicated uh, than, than the traditional narrative that I gave you at the start. Um, here are some of the other dealers and networks. These two uh, good friends, both major dealers in Cairo, both of them started out in the 1890s. Both of them are connected to the Geniza trade. Both started out in the 1890s. Neither one of them we know who and what they were dealing in the 1890s. They may have been connected to the early Geniza trade. Um, I look at in the books at some of the other possible fine spots. There were many uh, 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 places that, that could have uh, uh, fragments could have emerged from and got mixed up. Uh, uh, the Maimonides synagogue, uh, the El Imshati synagogue, both of them that were medieval synagogues that got restored, just like the Ben Ezra synagogue in the late 19th century. Um, <clears throat> I added an appendix to the book um, uh, uh, on the advice of a reviewer, uh, and I, I tried to break down the all of those collections, I showed you that big bubble of the Cairo Geniza and the main collections. And what I've tried to do is break down each connect collection by its sub-collections and the provenance of each sub-collection to try and, try and um, uh, uh, show the complexity and, and how all these manuscripts circulated. Um, some of the things that I wanted to talk about went on the cutting room floor. This is Henry Lancel. He did some uh, expeditions into Bukhara. And it's true, it didn't really have a strong connection to the Cairo Geniza, other than um, it showed different types of Genizot and uh, many manuscript hunters, and that he was given advice by um, a Geniza hunter on the sort of things to look for. So I had wanted to include him in the, in the book, but he didn't make it in. Um, <clears throat> this is, shows that there's much provenance tracing work remains. I've only sort of scratched the surface. Uh, this is a book in the Cambridge collection that come, is from 1863 and has no connection to the Geniza whatsoever, but is called uh, part of the Geniza collection. And if you, you want, I can answer some questions about that afterwards. Um, and finally, um, lost provenance. There's so much lost provenance and it continues today. And here is a sale from Christie's um, in 2005 to show 23 manuscripts for sale um, and, and who knows where they came from and how they got there. Um, so there, that's the story of <laughs> the Cairo Geniza and the Age of Discovery uh, in, in Egypt. And I hope, <laughs> I hope I haven't been too confusing, but please do ask, ask me questions and I'll try to clarify anything. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much. This is this is a riveting story. I, I learned so much <laughs> from your talk and um, I, yeah, I think we'll, um, so we're opening the floor for questions. Please either type question in the chat box or uh, you can type out your question if you're not able to talk. Um, but you show so well this, the, how complicated the issue of provenance is. Um, and uh, just the human connections uh, that are at the heart of research. Um, I have a question, uh, but I also see that other people are starting to um, to raise their hands. Um, so the question I have is about the financial, um, uh, you know, the financial aspect of the race to collecting and the competition between various research institutions, but also between individuals. If you can tell us a little bit more about that. And then I see that Professor Franklin has, has his hand up as well. So you're next, Arnold. Yes, so um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's the financial aspect is interesting because, well, particularly where it pertains to Solomon Schechter, because um, the way he told the story made it sound as though um, the rabbi had sort of just opened up the Geniza to him and said, take as much as you like. <laughs> um, but it wasn't actually the case and money did change hands. And um, as far as the ev uh, documentary evidence shows, uh, he paid at least uh, 300 pounds, which is something equivalent to 30,000 pounds today. Um, so there was generous payments made. Um, um, Gravel Chester, who I mentioned in the early uh, 1890s, he's um, purchasing the fragments from dealers and then selling them on to Oxford. Although 
it's very interesting to see sort of how the value placed on fragments. So he is in turn is getting paid quite a low sum for fragments, as opposed to uh, the sort of sums that they will pay for substantial manuscripts. And, and, and sort of interesting contrast to today, where you saw that, that sale at Christie's, uh, where, where uh, just 23 fragments raises something like $40,000. Um, does that answer? It does. And I see now that uh, there's a question from Margot Cates that I think um, addressed similar, similar wow. issues. Um, so I think I think your answer answers both of our questions. Um, Arnold, you're, you're next. Uh, Rebecca, thank you so much. That was really wonderful. Um, I, your book is on the way. Amazon assures me that it's on the way. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I can't wait. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions. Um, I'm going to fire them off. You can answer whichever <laughs> ones you want. Okay. Um, first of all, any comment on what's going on in Egypt today? Okay. <laughs> uh, right. Two, okay. Um, I find myself absolutely fascinated by this, but also as someone who works on these materials, somewhat horrified um, by the idea of, you know, what happened between 1889 and 1892. Um, do scholars like myself and my colleagues, do we, are, are, are we just kind of deluding ourselves that we're working on documents that uh, can be grounded in, in some sort of verifiable reality? Um, <laughs> right. If they were just out in a courtyard and we don't really know where they came from. <laughs> um, and, and three, um, just the fascination with origin stories. And it, it, it's impossible not to think about the Dead Sea Scrolls and you know, the very elaborate story about how they were discovered. And I don't know, do you have any thoughts about our fascination with the discovery stories of collections? Right. So cool. answer whatever awesome, you want. Awesome questions. Number one, oh gosh, it's uh, not very good news coming out of Cairo, but I don't wanna talk about it too much because I know that it's a very delicate situation um, for the community there. They've been working very hard um, to rebuild their library and restore synagogues and to work closely with the government. Um, and, and now uh, the situation that's coming out is, is a little bit precarious. So I think they would rather we didn't shine too bright a light on it right now while they're trying to negotiate and work things out. Um, two, deluding yourself. <laughs> no, I mean that I, I, it, it's, it's still it's it is hard to say. There has been a mix up of things, and um, but I, I still think we can ground. There's so much that we can ground, right? Because we have documents that were written in for start, and we have dated documents, and through those documents we can also um, know provenance other documents from a sim, uh, manuscripts from a similar period. Um, um, so there are things that we can say for sure came from that, uh, those environs um, and from uh, most likely from a Geniza in that environment. And so, um, and, and then there, there are, are, there are, there's evidence that there were, there was a Geniza or Genizot and that they were in the, the Ben Ezra synagogue for sure. And, 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 you know, many of the early materials just wouldn't have survived out in the open because of the temperature fluctuation. So wherever they were, they had to have been stored in conditions like the Ben Ezra synagogue. My, my, own, uh, um, um, my own suspicion is that, that there, there, was, there was a fire in the, in the 15th century. Um, and I suspect that, that the Geniza chamber survived intact. And, but when they restored the synagogue after the 15th century, that it became a sealed room at that point. So I think that most of what we find that's pri prior to 15th century is probably from that uh, fine spot. Um, what Greville Chester tells us is that in, when he went there in 1889, he discovered a room um, that, had been, that had been opened up and that the floor was covered with manuscripts. So we definitely know that there was a medieval chamber there. Um, how much, <laughs> we don't know. Um, but I, I think with regard to what we regard as classically Geniza, mostly can say that that's from there. But we might want to question if we have a letter that's been um, um, uh, written. So for ex example, uh, uh, there is a letter, I came across a letter that's written in Damascus and it's 15th century. Sorry, that's <laughs> my phone. Um, when something has been written in Damascus, we might want to question, well, how did it make its way to 
Cairo and end up in the Cairo Ganesha. When something doesn't fit that 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 uh, provenience, then we we might want to question it, and then we might want to think about these other uh, discovery stories. Uh, um, and 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 yes, origin stories are fascinating people. Everybody loves you know the the discovery of. And I begin my book with the discovery Howard Carter's discovery in, uh, of the the, the Tutankhamun uh, tomb, because that was something that fascinated me as a child, origin stories. I don't know why they have this <laughs> uh, frisson of excitement attached to them, but they certainly do. I hope that answers the questions. I hope that you get a call from Netflix very soon so oh. that we can see the movie. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, I wanted to go back to Margot Cates' question in the yes. chat because I think um, th there is an aspect of that question that uh, perhaps can be discussed a little further. Uh, you did mention that there was a, a sizable payment of 300 pounds. Did the synagogue receive those 300 pounds or was it intermediary along the way is that not received that money? Not terribly clear who the recipient was. I can see from the letters in the Bodleian um, that they were paying the rabbi. Um, uh, well, they're paying rabbi and uh, community leaders. So I assume that Shechter did the same. I assume that the payments went to the community leaders and then they decided how to benefit the community through those payments. Um, there was a lot of uh, synagogue building in the period. And so whether those payments went into new buildings rather than the old building, I, I suspect that that was more of the case. I'm sorry, I have to turn this off. <laughs> um, um, but um, yeah, unfortunately I've not been able to find evidence of where that money went. Um, it was hard to find the evidence of the payment in the first place. It, it, it crops up in, in letters from one protagonist to another. Um, mm -hmm. There is no sort of official record of the payment that I'm aware of, although there may be archives in Cairo that have yet to be uncovered that could shed light on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we're still waiting for questions. We have quite a bit of time left, uh, so please feel free to ask away. Um, I, I was wondering, um, you know, considering the time period and the personalities involved, the different nationalities, right? When, when you were showing the, the diagram, so people from Vienna, people from uh, Britain, people from France, um, and you, you did mention at some point that um, Henriquez was spying for Schechter. Right. <laughs> Do we know if there's a, a, you know, a connection between diplomatic efforts in the region and scholarly efforts in the region? If the people involved in gathering these, these fragments were also um, essentially political spies, <laughs> not, just, not just dealers, but were also gathering intelligence. Uh, as you know, along with scholarly information. That I haven't looked into, but I but there's certainly definitely a diplomatic connection because for sure many of the consuls um, were involved involved in the antiquities trade. Um, and many of the collectors and many of the institutions in Europe get their collections through the uh, assistance uh, or the donation from uh, consular figures. Um, and those include um, those include the representatives of the countries in 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 Cairo in Palestine, but also mm -hmm. also the agents that these European countries had um, uh, recruited from local people. So there were the uh, consular agents, uh, and um, they were they they were sort of businessmen of good standing in in these countries, and they were recruited as agents for 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 the European sort of countries mm -hmm. and not only are they acting in uh, 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 performing diplomatic duties they're also on the side um, um, finding uh, treasures for them so yes it's okay. a very interesting connection there a network that's going on um, which I hope I reveal a little fascinating. bit in the book. <laughs> yeah fascinating um, do I see other hands or other questions in the chat uh, Sandra Green, are you raising your hand to ask a question? 
I'm going to ask you to unmute. Uh, you're still muted. Uh, wait, you're still muted. Let me see if I can unmute you. Thank you. Uh, marvelous. And I suggest a mini series. It's sort of a Sherlock Holmes. And there's so many interesting characters, their, their faces, their, their dress. But I just was asking um, if you've come across or is it known, um, these dealers were trying to make a living. Right. Absolutely. So do we know what kinds of uh, the cost they could place on, I, I understood that you said a, a fuller manuscript was, of course, worth much more than a fragment, even right. though some might consider them holy fragments. But um, do, do we have any numbers for those um, sales? Right. Um, well, they're certainly, um, they're not going to make a lot out of Hebrew fragments. Because at this time, Hebrew fragments are until Schechter's massive discovery, which then catapults the sort of the the, um, the standing of the fragment <laughs> uh, into sort of greater limelight and 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 that sort of raises the price. In fact, uh, um, the count talks to Oxford afterwards and sends a letter and says, "Since Schechter has been, they're asking many more, um, they're asking for much more for a fragment than they used to ask for." Um, so it certainly uh, that raised the price. Um, but 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 even so, fragments were not um, not something they would make their living by. What they were making their living on uh, was the sale of papyri. papyri papyrus fragments there was a massive demand for those and wow. so what happens is actually um, some of these Geniza collections get um, bundled up in bundles of, of papyri and sold that way and so the dealer can make uh, quite a killing <laughs> on that um, uh, as well as uh, with the Geniza fragments. Uh, I thank you I also <laughs> just one more question um, connections at that time with the Dunhuang um, discoveries of a walled up collection. And of course, in, um, in the case of um, Buddhist fragments and manuscripts, a very old tradition also, um, not as old, but very old. Um, uh, is there, have you come across any contact between the two or three individuals um, who uh, founded the, uh, I think Oxford or Cambridge collection that young, young, young Tibetan scholars, young scholars of um, Tibetan Buddhism are working on those collections. Right, I haven't actually, but that's something now you've planted in my mind and I'm going to go and check. There may well be, there was so many, there was so much interconnectedness between all of these manuscript hunters um, and, and their sort of scholarly interests. So I, they, could well be, and I'm sorry that I can't supply. It was more convenient to go to Cairo, to downtown, oh, the old, uh, right. called the old, um, Bab old Babylon, Babylon, the mm -hmm. fortress of Babylon. That was easier to get to than the middle of the- Yes, <laughs> I imagine so, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. I see a question uh, from Hannah Woolman, uh, who's asking if Israel has any interest in purchasing. Geniza fragments. Uh, now or then? Um, certainly, there's I, I suppose now. Yeah, is Israel yeah. trying to buy those those papers? Um, she's asking. I don't know. I assume there would be interest. I, the National Library of Israel, does seem to uh, want to be at the forefront of the, sort of the rescue of things that are um, uh, sort of. That might otherwise end up in private hands and kind of disappear. I, I've seen them do that in the past, but I, I don't know. I've no, no idea really uh, what's mm -hmm. going to happen with the current situation, unfortunately. But mm -hmm. but certainly there is a, a there's a Geniza collection um, in the uh, National Library, and that too came about as part of um, you know I. I Told you all about Mordechai Adelman, and he was very connected to uh, the the establishment of the early uh, Jewish public library in Jerusalem, which eventually became the National Library. So all of his uh, connections in the manuscript trade possibly fed into that early collection as well. So there's always been a, a strong interest in Geniza uh, in, in, frag in fragments uh, in Israel. Hope that answers. 
Can I ask another question about uh, you know, problems of provenance. I, I know that many, many libraries now are dealing with the uncertain, in some cases, untraceable provenance of some of their collections. And there are ethical questions that come up and many of those purchases were done, you know, they, they, they were, from the middle of the 20th century or the 50s or the 60s. And they have to do clearly also with purchasing uh, items that came from Europe, you know, in, in a post-Holocaust mm -hmm. world. It, are there any of those concerns applying to Geniza fragments or because we're talking about a different time period, a different part of the world, those questions uh, have been asked in a different way or yeah. have not been asked? I don't think they've been asked much, uh, and it's something I, I do touch upon a little bit uh, in, in, in the conclusion of my book. Um, but it, it is a complex, again, it's a complicated situation because we're talking about um, a, a, a manuscripts that were, were sold uh, uh, and purchased, sometimes in good faith. Um, uh, it, it, we're, talking about, we're talking about manuscripts that were discarded, essentially. It's a complicated issue because for many communities, these these were still sacred objects and the opening of a Geniza was often regarded as a disaster, would bring um, calamity. They, they had curses surrounding them. You weren't supposed to disturb a Geniza. On the other hand, as I said, this was discarded material. So, uh, you know, if you, if you uh, encounter scraps that have been tossed out <laughs> and, and and when they did the restoration of the synagogue they did indeed toss out many manuscripts treated them as trash so it, it's really <laughs> it gets it again gets complicated so I, I touch on it a little bit and I particularly with regard to uh, some of the um, institutional treatments of these fragments um, in the early period I mean today when you look at the collections around the world um, that they're, they're, they're treated very, they're treated beautifully, um, you know, conserved very well. Uh, uh, scholars are given uh, access. So, uh, you know, I have no criticisms for the institutions of today and the way that they're, 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 they're treating these collections. But I think we can look back to the sort of the early 20th century and some of the practices. Um, some of the things were stored, if we're in Cambridge, for example, things were stored in boxes for decades. Um, uh, in Oxford, for example, things were uh, sort of misclassified um, and provenance sort of um, uh, not captured in the best way. And um, so it, it's, uh, it, I think we can ask questions of, of the early treatment of these fragments and how that led to this obscuring of provenance. Answers the question. <laughs> yeah, no, this is it's absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. There's a there's a comment uh, by Rachel Leckedmore. Uh, she's mentioning that the next issue of Judaica librarianship will include a few pieces on provenance of Jewish books. So please feel, feel free to submit articles. And the link is in the chat. So if anybody is interested in the subject, um, are there any other questions? If there are no other questions or comments, uh, we can bring the evening to a close. And I want to thank you, Rebecca Jefferson, so much again for a wonderful, wonderful presentation, uh, thrilling. And I invite you all to uh, purchase the book. And um, if, if, if you buy directly from the publisher, the codes are in the chat, you can get 20% off. Um, so thank you again. This was, this was a, a real treat. Um, and um, we look forward to hearing more about your research uh, you as, so as your project develops. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to talk to you all this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>